and amen. So I have three things that I really want to share with you as part of today's service. I want to talk to you about the day and age that we live in, the most hated truth of the Bible, the reality of a place called hell, and the desperate need for all of us to share the good news of the gospel. You know, from the beginning of this series, we've been making this case that there's a war that's been going on in the heavens that started long before we ever got here on earth, that Satan has been raging against the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but guess what? There's real ramifications that happen right here on earth. They can be felt. Do you sense this war around you? It's not just the culture wars of our day, but do you see all the evilness that's going on in our world? And doesn't it seem like it's on the increase? Has anybody noticed that? It seems like it's getting worse and worse. I remember, uh, now I know, now that I'm getting a little bit older, sometimes we long for the good old days. Any of you who are maybe like over 30 starting to say that? Like I remember the good old days, right? So Man, so much has changed in our society, even over the past five or ten years, that it's almost unrecognizable from the day and age in which I grew up in, which wasn't all that long. I ain't that old, people. Come on. Jesus. Hallelujah. But this war has been raging on, and there are casualties that are all around us. And part of this series has been that we don't want any of the people of Journey to be casualties of this war, right? We want to be strong. We want to be courageous. We want to be bold. We want to be advancing the kingdom of God in our generation and sharing the hope that we have with those around us with the hope that they too would find the lover of their soul, none other than Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. It's imperative to note that Satan hates God, right? doesn't need to be stated, but guess what? You and I were created and formed in the image of God, so in turn, he hates you. He hates you. Do you get that? He and his minions and his armies are going to do whatever they can to take us out. But we have a defense in Jesus Christ. So in Matthew 13, God gives us a bit of an understanding of how the kingdom of God works. What we're experiencing in our own generation. It starts out by saying in Matthew 13, 1, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood by the beach and he told them many things in parables saying, a sower went out to sow. Right? So just like in our generation, it's the same thing. We follow in his footsteps. Crowds of people gather in person or today online or even one by one. And the good news of the gospel is shared, right? Some people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Others don't, right? It's a sad fact. But guess what? The gospel needs to continue to be preached. Can I get an amen to that? We need to continue to preach the gospel and share our very lives. So when you talk about the sower going out to sow, what he's saying is that he's sowing the seeds of the gospel. And he's going to tell us how they begin to take fruit. And he sowed and some of the seeds fell along the path. And the birds devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns and thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I pray that you have ears to hear what we're saying today. I pray that God would give us those ears. I pray that almost every service when we kick it off, Lord, would you give us eyes to see? Would you give us ears to hear? And then would you give us the power to put your word into practice in our everyday lives? Because guess what? A lot of people heard but didn't really hear when those words were being preached, right? A lot of people saw what Jesus was doing but they didn't really see, it didn't change them, it didn't alter their actions. And he gives us some of the reasons why. We all know Christians that may be shot up and they seem like they were shooting stars and they quickly faded out. We all know other Christians who maybe seem like they were on the right track and then the worries of the world began to choke them out, right? And then we don't see them around church anymore. We don't see them in fellowship with other believers. We look at them online and we say, how could they have strayed so far from what they first believed? And he's telling us why. 
And part of it is those birds that he was talking about that go steal the seeds is that the devil's going to do anything he can to block the word from taking root in our lives. He hates us. He doesn't want us to come to know Jesus and the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, in our generation, if you use the analogies that were there, guess what? You and I are workers in the field. We're the ones who were called to sow the seeds of the gospel into the lives of others. And that comes with some prerequisites that we've shared a lot of times around journey. That means you and I must first and foremost be disciples. We must be followers of Jesus, a people who find our identity in the king, who live lives of worship in community on mission, right? We need to be about the king's work. We're supposed to make that the primary purpose and focus of our lives. Yet everything in life will try to steal that time from us and keep us from our primary mission and calling. We're supposed to be a people who pray. We're supposed to be a people who share the gospel. But I ask you, when's the last time you shared the gospel? Hopefully for most of you that answer is very recently, right? But for some of you, you might be saying, man, you're right, I haven't done that. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but there is a challenge for us that our very lives would represent who he is, right? That we wouldn't have to share the gospel with words as much as we live it out in our everyday lives and people just see it at work in us, which provides the opportunity for us to share it in words also. Can I get an amen? You and I who are in this room today, because others who went before us loved us enough to pray for us. See, part of that seed planting is prayer. That's why I love what's going on at 9 a.m. And I encourage you to come a little bit early one day. If you've never been to our 9 a.m. prayer service, I encourage you to come a little bit earlier. Show up in the back. Come hang out with us. If you've got kids, bring them with you so that they could see God at work in prayer. You're going to hear what you're going to hear if you show up is a people who are crying out for others in there. They're saying, Lord, would you save today? Lord, would you deliver today? Lord, would you heal today? Lord, could we meet you in this place today? Lord, we invite you into this house of God. Would you transcend your physical presence in here, even to those who are online, and touch them wherever they might find themselves? There's people who love you, whether you know it or not. You might have walked in here today and you don't feel loved, but there were people this very morning who were praying for you back there that you may never meet in person, but who love you enough to pray for you. That's part of our jobs as believers in Jesus Christ, to pray and to intercede. And then for those of us who are in this room, guess what? At some time, somebody took the opportunity to share the gospel with you. Maybe it was something as simple as, hey, would, I, would you come join me at church? I invite you to join me at church. Would you come where they heard the gospel preached? For others of you, maybe you got to sit down and share with them what Jesus did in your life, how he changed you and transformed you, and it opened up that door for you to tell them how much Jesus loves them too and that he wants to do the same thing for them. But all of us had that kind of encounter, and I always like to say with some of my little taglines, the gospel's only as good as the next generation. If you and I don't share it with others, this next generation is going to be lost. And they're hearing a very different gospel out there in the world. The world's trying to teach them some craziness right now. Some craziness that stands in complete opposition to everything that we believe. And let me tell you something. If you think it's going to get easier to share the gospel in the days ahead, it's not going to get any easier to share the gospel. Because we used to live in the Bible Belt. How many of y'all know you lived in the Bible Belt right now, right? We live in like South Georgia, but it's the Bible Belt, right? Those day and ages are fading. It used to be some benefit to be a believer. Now we are getting mocked. Now people are making fun of us. Now people are saying we're haters. Now the world is starting to turn the tide against those who are believers in Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be a Christian in that context here in America? It's a very different kind of context, is it not? Go share your faith online in a real and genuine way. And I bet you because you're having some friends who are around you, they're going to give you some amens. But there's going to be some other people, if the subject is even a little bit controversial, who are going to try to nail you. They're going to try to kill you. They're going to hate you. And they're going to try to cancel you, right? That's the world we live in today. So we need to be bold. We need to be strong in sharing our faith. So the devil, again, if we go back to that, and his minions, 
they try to do anything they can to keep us from living for Christ or sharing our faith. They'll use fear. They'll use intimidation. Have you seen any of that in recent tactics, right? Don't we live in a world where everybody's at fear? We're afraid to get within six feet of our friends. Do you hear me? He'll use everything to try to keep us apart from one another. And yes, he'll even create pestilences that will cause us to get sick and some sadly to even die. How insane is the devil? He will take us out with every chance that he gets. He'll also use other things like ignorance. Where we don't take time to know God. We don't take time to know the word. He'll try to keep us occupied with other things that are meaningless in this life to keep us from truly knowing God and sharing his word. God describes some of the tactics and some of the hearts which are encountered. He says the birds come to steal. So guess what? Somebody becomes a believer and then all of a sudden the devil starts to send out his minions to go after us and he'll send some little birdies to go speak into our ears and start to, oh, that isn't true what you just heard. That's not true. That's not the gospel. Oh, so-and-so did this, whatever. He'll use whatever he can to get in there and start to speak into our ears and into our hearts and minds. He'll raise trouble up in your life. Have you ever noticed that? It says the thorns and the worries of this world will choke you out. How many of you have ever tried to get ahead in any way and then all of a sudden the thorns start coming up and everything gets more difficult, right? Think about it even then a natural uh, you know, I live on a farm, but on the outskirts, when you start to go into the woods, there's all these blackberry bushes. Now that seems fun, right? Oh yeah, go pick you some blackberries. But guess what? There's a bunch of thorns on blackberry bushes. They are way more of a nuisance than they are going out there to get the blackberries because they barely ever are in season. But if you try to traverse through there and you don't have the right pants on and stuff, I am telling you, it is not a pleasant experience. You will come back all cut up. You will come back hating life. You will not go into the woods. I barely go into the woods. The woods are of the devil sometimes. If it's not the thorns that get you, then all of a sudden the ticks get you. And then each time of the year, there's a different thing. Sometimes you go out there and there's these things called banana spiders. Does anybody know what a banana spider is? It looks like a tarantula. It's like this big. And you'll go out there and all of a sudden it'll be sitting right in your face like that, right? Those things are all of the devil in Jesus' name. Like, you got to have clear green pastures. Hallelujah. Jesus, just spread it out. Now I'm getting far from my message today. But. It says he'll trample us underfoot. But I love that last verse. It said some fell on good soil. Some fell on good soil. There's a lot of good soil in this room. And there's a lot of good soil online. Praise you guys who are watching us and joining us from afar today. Scripture goes on to describe the day and age in which we live in, Matthew 13, 24. He put another parable before them saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed seeds among them and wheat and went away. When the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared also, and the servants of the master of the house came to him and said, Master, did you not sow good seed into your field? How is it that we have weeds? But then he said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, when do you want us to go gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. If you use the wheat and tear analogy that's there, doesn't it seem like there's a lot less wheat and a lot more people out there who are not followers of Jesus Christ right now? Doesn't it seem like there's a lot of people standing in opposition to what we're living? And then we look at it in our day and age and we're like, why, Lord, why? It says in the, in the last days, these difficult things, these challenges are going to increase. That Christians are actually going to be a minority, right? But a powerful, spirit-filled minority of believers. And he says, guess what? The world that we live in today is one where there is great evil that's in the midst right now of some great Holy Spirit filled people. And it says that the Holy Spirit is a restraining power on that evil, right? But could you imagine a world without the Holy Spirit? Could you imagine with the evil that we already see what it would be like in the absence of God's presence? And that's where we're gonna start to transition in just a second to this conversation about hell. 
Because it's pretty bad out there right now, but it compares nothing to the reality of hell. And when people, we don't often preach on this subject here at Journey Church. Maybe we should preach on it a lot more because Jesus himself preached on it a whole lot. And a lot of people don't want to talk about this subject because it's a difficult one. Eric, we could talk about heaven all day. And guess what? We're going to talk about heaven next week. You guys cool with that? We're going to talk about heaven next week. But today we need to talk about this challenging place called hell. But in the world we live in today, man, there is all of this evil that's out there. He gives all these sewing analogies, and maybe you could think of it like this. I don't know, have you ever lived in a neighborhood like where your neighbor had that absolutely perfect lawn? You know, for a while, Mary Jo and I lived in Eagle Harbor, and there was this competition to have, like, the immaculate lawn. Now, when we live out there in the country, it just don't matter anymore. Like, if you mow it once a month, you're okay. Hallelujah, Jesus, right? But I remember in our yard, I was trying to keep this good yard for some period of time. And there was this devilish thing out there called a dollar weed. Have any of you ever encountered the dollar weed? Yeah, so some of y'all know what I'm talking about. No matter what you do, you could not extinguish the dollar weed. I mean, I would go out there and I'd put special stuff down. We had the kids when they were bad, when they were kids, they had to go out there and pick the dollar weeds out of the yard. And it still did nothing to keep the dollar weeds from coming back up. And that's kind of like the evil in our generation right now. Like it seems like like momentarily there is nothing you can do from keeping this evil to multiply but God reminds us through his word that one day something very challenging and dangerous is going to happen if you read on to verse 30 it says let both grow together until the harvest and at harvest time I will tell the reapers gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into my barn And he's not giving this natural analogy. He's talking about a spiritual analogy that those who don't believe, one day justice is coming. One day evil will be given an account where they're going to have to sit at that judgment seat and be accounted for all of the evil that they have done. They might not experience it here in this world, but guess what? They're going to experience it in the time to come. And when we think of the reality of that statement, it's pretty easy to read over but may it truly send chills down our spine that we would know how much we've been saved from and what we've been saved for. That verse and many others like it make clear that judgment will come and scripture tells us that those who die apart from Jesus are sentenced to an eternity in a place called hell. I don't know if human words can fully describe this place, but I want to allow Scripture to do the work that only it can do in our hearts with the hope that it compels us to be a people who more aggressively share the good news of the gospel with the hope that none of our friends, none of our family members, none of our acquaintances ever have to go to this very horrific place. You see, hell isn't a place where you go to party with your friends. Hell's not that place. Oh, let's go there. It's going to be fun. We're going to party there. You know, all the jokes that people say about that. Yeah, it's going to be much better to party in hell than it's going to be to hang out with those little angels in heaven, right? The world has its way of trying to make things light, but this isn't a very light subject. Hell is a place of never-ending torment. We don't want to think about that all that much, but maybe we should. Let's talk about the reality of hell. Hell is a total conscious eternal separation from the Lord. What does that mean? It means those who end up in hell will be cut off from God forever. Luke 23, 43 teaches us that believers will end up in the presence of God. 2 Thessalonians 1, 9 reminds us that unbelievers will end up away from the presence of God. You might say, Eric, that doesn't sound so bad. But it says every good and pleasant thing comes from the Lord, right? So can you imagine a world where the presence of God is absent? Utter and total darkness. I talked about the restraining power of the Holy Spirit. I talk about even some common sense, like these talks about defunding police. How do you think that's going to end? Is there corruption? Yes, that that stuff has to be dealt with. But think about a world where there are no good police out there, right? 
You think about places like areas of Mexico or Colombia when they were ruled by the drug lords. See, what happens is in the absence of good justice and good policing and good health, or in this case, the presence of the Holy Spirit, when you remove that, it creates a vacuum for which evil comes into and overtakes everything. So if you say you don't want any police just talking about something in the natural that's a big hot button, guess what? Yeah, you're going to get rid of the bad police. Praise God, they need to be gone. I'm not saying that they don't need to be gone at all, right? But guess what? The good police are gone, and then the gangs end up ruling the place, right? The ba- is that the kind of world that we really want to live in, in the natural? So guess what? You magnify that times 100,000, and you talk about that in hell, and guess what? The devil and his demons are ruling and reigning in that place called hell, right? It's complete and utter evil, complete and utter darkness, It's a horrible, horrible situation for all of eternity. God is the thing that brings goodness into this world and into this life. And his absence is something that should send great fear into all of us. When you're shut off from the Lord for eternity, you experience the full weight of your sin. Their life in hell will ultimately be unrelenting guilt, unrelenting shame, unrelenting conviction, and feeling the effects of their sin for all eternity. I'm going to phrase the next couple things in the form of questions and then answer them. Why did God create hell? It says the everlasting fire of hell was prepared for Satan and his angels. But when humans joined the devil in rebellion against God, they were condemned to share the punishment prepared for the fallen angels. It wasn't created for a place that you and I should have ever had to go, right? But when we join in cosmic rebellion, you're actually on team Satan instead of on team God. Guess what? There's repercussions for that decision. It says then in Matthew 25, 41, then he also said to those on his left, depart from me, you accursed people into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to the pits of darkness held for judgment, 2 Peter 2, 4. It's not a very good place, is it? It's a terrible place. What is it like? Revelations 14, 9 gives us a little bit of a description. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives the mark on his forehead or his hand, he will also drink of the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength out in the cup of his anger, and will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they will have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark and his name. Eternal torment, fire and sulfur, no rest. Have you ever tried to not sleep for like more than a day? Some of you who suffer from insomnia, it's a terrible, terrible thing. Man, I I know if I get up and it's like past 12 or 1 o'clock at night, I start to get a little goofy, right? And I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about no rest, unrelenting, torment, sulfur, fire, darkness. This is an awful, awful place that is a real place. We have to understand that. As believers, we look at the gospel and we want to think about the good things, but God tells us that there is this place of torment for those who don't believe. And our job as believers is not to go preach fire and brimstone to them all the time, right? That tactic doesn't often work. It repels more people than it draws in, right? I'm sharing this message on hell primarily in the context of believers, right? With the hope and the motivation that we would say, man, hell is actually real and I need to live my life for Jesus, not because I'm in danger of going to hell. I've got my heavenly fire insurance. Lord, I want to live my life to please you as an act of worship. And I want to share with other people with the hope that they will come to know you so that they never have to end up in that place. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks. We're going to get into a revelation series and we'll talk more about the mark. A lot of people have asked the question, is the vaccine the mark? So I want to address that for one quick second. I I don't believe it's the mark because it's not asking you in any way, shape or form to pledge your allegiance to this demonic beast 
right, in this particular case? Could it be a setup to start to get us to say, yeah, like we're, we're willing to take these things much easier, maybe in that regard, but I don't believe, you know, that the vaccine in any way, shape, or form is the mark. We're not making any political statement here or not. I'm just trying to answer that particular question surrounding it because when the mark actually comes, you'll know you're going to be pledging allegiance to something for the purpose of buying and selling and worship of the beast, right? So we'll discuss that in much greater detail in a few weeks when we talk about that particular set of scripture when we get into our revelation series. You guys good with that? Matthew 13, 41, if we go back to where we were, it says, the son of man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, never ending weeping. You know, I only spent one night in jail in my life right? It was not a good experience. If you go into those kinds of places, or you go into places where there's serious mental health issues, there's continuous yelling, screaming, crying out, terror, horror, fear. If you think about maybe a movie that you've seen or other things, I pray you've never been in that same experience like I was or never had to endure it for a long period of time. But you go into those places, you ain't getting good rest, right? Maybe you even think of like a hospital, they wake you up and for a good cause, they're jabbing you and sticking you and you hear constant stuff all the time. But this is for a bad one. You could think of hell like that prison cell where people around you are weeping. They're gnashing their teeth in fear. They're gritting their teeth. There's this horrible smell. Nothing is good about it. You're locked up. You can never rest. You never sleep. You think you're going to go get a few moments of rest and someone starts crying out and yelling out and you have no opportunity to have any peace in your life. That is what hell is like and that is what what the Bible is describing here, gritting their teeth in pure agony. Think of the story of Lazarus. You will be conscious in hell. He's in hell and he's conscious and he could see some things. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted his eyes and saw Abraham far off. So for some reason, they can actually see what's going on in other places. And Lazarus by his side, he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. So much so that you're so thirsty that you're willing to take, in this case, you were the rich guy, and then you've got crazy old Lazarus over here who you considered a dog in the natural life, and all of a sudden you're like, let this dog come in and give me a dip of the water to put it in my tongue so that I could receive it to attempt to cool off with a simple drop. Are y'all getting the picture here? And that's not the end. I only have the chance today to share a couple of these. I'm going to share one or two more. But go into the Bible, it talks big time about this subject. It's not something that we typically want to go study, but I'm telling you, maybe it's important that we go study it. It says there's a never-ending thirst. How many of you are like, you're so thirsty, I'm going to die? No, 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 that's not what it's talking about here. And darkness. You know, the Bible actually describes levels of darkness. Do you know that? There's more than one kind of darkness. Black darkness, outer darkness, utter darkness. You know, Scott Roberts was with us and he said he got to go not long ago to a cave, a bat cave up in North Carolina. And when he was there, they take him way down and then they have lights that are accompanying them and they turn out the lights and he said, it was like utter darkness. You could not see anything. And man, there's a fear that's overcoming. So you're in this place and these demons are there and it's utterly dark and you can't see them. And all of a sudden they come up and want to tear you apart because they're the ones who are in control. They're beating you up. There's stories of people who have been to hell and came back to life. And there are stories of the demons tormenting them and beating them up and tearing them up and they couldn't die. It is as if the flesh was ripped off their body, as one guy I was watching that was describing it. The, the demon came up and threw him up against a wall and ripped the flesh off his body. It felt like every single bone in his body was broken, but he wouldn't die. Forever, torment forever, utter, utter darkness. How scary is this? And we're not done yet. You're like, please stop. Gehenna. There's also levels in hell which I don't have time to fully describe. There's the lake of fire, there's the abyss, there's other levels in hell and levels of torment. One of those places is called Gehenna or Ben Hinnom, 
was originally in the valley of Jerusalem where Jews once sacrificed their children in the fire to Molech. They would sacrifice their children. Later, it became a garbage dump, an enormous deep pit kept constantly burning where bodies of dead animals and criminals were thrown, Isaiah 30, 33, 66, 24. It was known as a place of judgment and death of putrid smoke like sulfur, continuous burning all the time, garbage heap, garbage dump where children were sacrificed. How insane is that? The closest I've ever got to that is Mary Jo and I took a trip to Peru. And we went to a place where they took us to a garbage dump. That wasn't on our vacation destination. You know, I didn't think about going there. We were on a missions trip, praise God, right? So we go to this garbage dump that was out there. And one of the things that we encountered was a bunch of children that lived in the garbage dump. We didn't see it that particular day, but there were stories of these children fighting the vultures for scraps of food. The garbage truck would come in and begin to dump the food and all the kids would come gathering around it trying to sift through the garbage with the hope that they could find just a little bit of food. Stinky, putrid, living that way. And they're saying this is the kind of place that hell is like. Continuous torment, sulfur, garbage, children sacrificed. How awful is this? Ultimately, hell is a place of eternal punishment for both body and soul. Eric, all of this is too painful. Why would God create a place like this? I just can't believe it. I wish I could tell you that it wasn't true. Yet there is an answer. Knowing what a horrible place it is and not wanting anyone we know to or love to go there, may it compel us to pour out our lives in an attempt to share the love of Jesus Christ with them. Luke 10, 2, and it says, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out har laborers into his harvest. I'm here to tell you that the harvest is ripe in our generation. It is ripe in our generation. People see all the craziness that's going around and people are searching for answers. They could see that this isn't the way that it's supposed to be. Something deep within our guts tells us that this is not what life is supposed to be about. May it compel us who are believers, who have been saved, who never have to go to that place, who get to experience an eternity in heaven, in God's presence where there's nothing but good. Hallelujah, right? We'll talk about that next week. Would it compel us? to live holy, to set aside some of the things with this reality that our life is really short here. Every day that ticks by, my life is getting shorter and shorter than it used to be. When we see pestilences like COVID, it reminds us, even as some of our friends and family members and others have already succumbed to that or right now are in the hospital, people that we love who were standing here maybe a few weeks ago who seemed absolutely healthy and then all of a sudden they're on a ventilator, and we fear for their future, your tomorrow is in no way guaranteed, right? We don't have necessarily 20 more years on the clock or 30 more years on the clock. All we have is today. How are you gonna live today? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? If you've not done that, I pray that today you would say, Lord, I surrender my heart to you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and your priorities aren't right, would you lay them down at the altar today? Would you say, Lord, I repent for living the way that I'm living. I repent for not putting you first. Lord, I repent for the sin in my life. Lord, I repent for not sharing the gospel. I repent for not being in your word and growing in your word so I can share it with others. Lord, I repent that I only pray for two minutes a day when I know that, Lord, I should be spending more time with you. Lord, I repent for putting Facebook more important than you or Instagram more important than you or social media more important to you, or Love Island, or whatever the stupid shows are that are out there right now that's more important to you. Lord, I'm putting all my time and energy into all these things, and I've not done it at the expense of a relationship with you. Lord, I want to walk in anointing. I want to walk in power. I want to walk in boldness. Just receive that prayer. I'll take it. That's the prayer that I pray right now. Lord, Lord, that's what I'm believing for. Lord, I want to live for you. Lord, forgive me for not having my priorities straight when friends and brothers and sisters and people we love are going to an eternity with hell. May we never fear sharing it with them. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? We've gone long today, forgive me. 
If you've got your kids, please run back there and get them so those teachers don't want to beat me up. Lord, this subject matter certainly sends chills down my spine, Lord God. I don't want to believe it. I don't want to receive that there's a place like that. But Lord, I know that the reality is true. Jesus, you preached on it many, many times. And I know that there's a war in the heavens and the devil would like to do all he can to deceive us and tell us that this place is not real. But Lord, it's right there in your word. And forgive me for ignoring it all too often in favor of other subjects that aren't as challenging. Lord, we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit and we thank you for your presence in our life. We thank you for the restraining power of evil that is still at work in our generation. And Lord, we want to be a part of that. We want to be part of the solution. We want to be a people of peace and not fear. We want to be a people who bring comfort and hope and joy to those around us. We want to be a people who remind or or, or so attractive to others that they want what we have and say, man, I'm going to go to any length to get it because you're different than what I see in the world, Lord. Would we be those kinds of believers that it would open up doors in our life to share the good news of the gospel? So if you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus or in hearing this message, whether in person or those of you who are online, you could write it in the chat room. If you need to rededicate your life to to Jesus today, man, I'd love to share that moment with you right here, right now. Just do me a favor. Nobody's looking around. If that's you and you need to either dedicate or rededicate your life to Christ today, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand up real high right where you're at? Is there anyone today? The lights are down. Father, being believers in this place, we pray this message would stir us to action. Father, I pray you gave us eyes to see and ears to hear. And Lord, now I pray that you would give us the power to put your word into practice in our lives. Father, that we would leave this place and boldly live as disciples, that we would share the good news of the gospel, that we would be a people of prayer, a people of your presence, a people who are anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit to make change in our own generation. So Lord, we leave this place on mission for you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. If you need prayer, feel free to come up to the front.